Hi folks. Today I want to share kind of a fun little uh, effect that I've been working on, and this is giving a way to kind of emulate fracturing within a flip simulation. And this gives kind of like a gooier sort of destruction workflow. Uh, and it's basically just applying the regular destruction workflow you would use maybe in RBDs, um, but emulating that in flip using viscosity instead. So let's go ahead and get started. I'll just drop down a geometry node here, and we'll just call this flip fracture. We'll dive inside, and the first thing we're going to do is just set up a very sort of basic fracturing workflow. So let's do something simple. Let's just grab ourselves a box. Um, one by one by one is just fine. I'm going to move this. I'll drop a transform for it. I'm going to move this up maybe somewhere a little bit higher. And the idea is we're going to drop this down onto something. So very basic workflow there. And of course, we're going to want to fracture this. So. I'm going to do an ISO offset. I want to get sort of points within this, uh, so not just on the surface of it. So if I scattered, I would get points just on the surface. I want points throughout this thing. So I'm just going to make a fog volume here. I'll just bump up those divisions. So this is just giving me a density representation. And we'll just throw that into a scatter. Uh, I'm not going to want a thousand pieces. Uh, the sort of density and resolution of a flip sim I would need to get all those individual chunks is going to be just way too high. Uh, so I'm going to drop this way down. Let's drop this to something like, I don't know, maybe maybe 24 pieces. Well, maybe, maybe 30. There we go. That should be fine. So with those pieces in place, let's just drop a Voronoi Fracture. And here we are set up with our sort of very standard, very normal sort of fracturing workflow. And I could pass this into RPD and drop it and shatter it, but that's not what we're going to do today. So each of these has a name. That's perfect. That's what I want. And we've got sort of all, uh, where are we here? All 30 of our pieces there. Great. Now, the next thing I'm going to do, ultimately what I want is these to be particles. So I don't want these pieces. And I don't mean that I want to assemble them into points. I mean that I want to sort of turn these into clumps of particles. So let's just take our whole thing here and do a points from volume. And right away, we're going to get our first sort of parameter here. So let's just drop ourselves a parameter null. I'll give that its own sort of shape and color here. And then let's go ahead and add some parameters here. And the first one we're going to want is just going to be our particle separation. Uh, so I'll call this PSEP and particle separation. There we go. Okay, so this is going to govern kind of the scale of our simulation here. And I'm going to choose something kind of intermediate, something like 0.03 should be pretty good. And I'll just go ahead and copy that, go into my points from volume, and replace this with paste relative references. So that's going to give us 37,000 points. So that's like nothing at all that will simulate. Nice and quickly, we should be able to actually see what we're doing here. Um, obviously, if I was going to do a real simulation, I would want to be up by at least a factor of 10, maybe a factor of 100. But for our purposes, let's just start with uh, this nice, nice little set of particles. So what we want to do is figure out for each of these particles, which of these pieces is it inside, and also how deep inside that piece it is. To get that information, what we're going to want is a volume representation. Um, but we can't just drop, so we could do, say, a VDB from polygons here. But if we just do this on our fractured volume here, we're just going to get one box. Um, we don't have pieces anymore. We don't have any idea of where each of those individual chunks was. So we can't do this with the whole geometry here. Um, we're going to want to do this inside of a loop. So let's go ahead and drop a for each named primitive loop. Because what we have here is our primitives are the ones that have the name. So. This should be set up by default. It's using primitives. It's using the name attribute. And it's going to loop over those. So this should loop over 30 elements here. Perfect. And what we want to do is for each of those, generate a VDB. Now this is going to give us a sign distance field here. Um, the voxel size is way too high. I'm going to drop this nice and low um, get ourselves some good detail here. We're only going to do this once, uh, so I'm going to just look, really crank this up, give ourselves some, some really nice detail, um, certainly higher than we have for our point separation, so that should be fine. And what we're going to get here, and we can talk about this a little bit more in a minute, 
is um, what's called the surface density function. And what this actually stores is for each of the voxels that it stores information on, it's telling you how close is it to the surface of the, the piece that it's representing. So if we have um, this chunk here, each of the values in the SDF is actually saying how far away am I from this surface. So what we see here is kind of a representation um, of where the zeros are, where those zero voxels are, but really the whole volume within these bandwidths um, is sort of storing how far am I from the surface. So if we want to know for each point how deep is it in this piece, we actually want to sort of toggle this checkbox here. And this is saying instead of using these band voxels, which is saying basically three voxels outside of the shape and three voxels inside, store your distances and everything else will just be sort of uh, constant, we want to actually fill right down to the middle. And so that means the entire interior is going to have values uh, that we're going to be able to reference. Okay, so that's great. Um, if we were to pass this straight through, we would just do that for each piece. It's going to take it a quick second, but not very long. Now you can see that we have all of these individual volumes. And if we look under the primitives here, you can see that we have 30, so 0 through to 29, 30 individual volumes here. And that is what we want. We want to be able to sort of keep these volumes separate. Unfortunately, they each have exactly the same name, and that's not going to be super useful for us. So we want to actually keep track of the names of these things so that we can reference them individually. And to do that, fortunately, name is just a primitive attribute here, and we can just go ahead and drop the primitive wrangle and just rename them. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to put this primitive wrangle here. It's reevaluating the whole thing. Let me just go to our last piece. Um, so this thing is named surface here. What I really want is to give it a new name that is basically the name of the piece that's coming through. And that's pretty easy. We can just pipe this in here. And we can just say asset name equals prim from geometry, geometry stream 1, because it's the second input here. I want the name of that piece, and just for prim 0 because all I'm getting is a single primitive. So now we've got piece 29 on this last piece. And if we go through all of them, now our volumes are named the same as the piece names that they came from. OK. So with this in mind, or with this sort of available, what we want to do is figure out for each of these points here, which volume is it inside, and how deep inside that volume is it. So we can drop an attribute wrangle here. We know we're going to want these points to process those, and we're going to want to sort of evaluate these volumes. Um, if we were doing this for a single point, or sorry, for a single volume, um, this would just be a matter of a simple sort of volume sample. And typically that would be sort of surface. Um, since we have some, you know, we know how many, but in principle it's procedural, we have some number of volumes here, um, we need to do things a little bit differently. And what we're going to do, instead of just referencing a single volume, we're actually going to check every volume. And we're going to sort of keep track of which one has the minimum value, so which one has the smallest value. Because th when you go inside of a volume, you're getting negative values, outside are positive. So we want to find the smallest negative value. And whichever volume that comes from, that's the volume that that's the piece that we're interested in. So to do that, uh, we need to start and we need to figure out how many primitives are we dealing with. So let's just say num vol, and we can just do n primitives. And this is just asking how many primitives are in this, uh, this second stream here. And that's going to be 30. You can see that here. We have 30 primitives, one primitive for each volume. Now we're just going to loop over those. So for int, let's call it b for volume, volume equals 0, b less than num vol, B plus plus, we're going to want to sample those volumes. Now, we know that these volumes are coming in and they're numbered, they're named, piece 0 through to piece 29. So however many volumes there are, um, there's that many sort of piece that number. So we have these indices V, so we can just reconstruct that name. Um, so let's just say string ball name, we're going to use sprintf. And this is going to be piece, percent %d, which is a placeholder for an integer, and then v. So this is the name of the volume that we're going to be looking up here. 
Now the, let's call it depth maybe. So now the depth inside this volume we can get with volume sample. We're going to go from geometry string 2, or sorry, 1, which is input 2, and we're going to look at ball name, and we want to check the position of that point. So this is going to tell us for each sort of volume what's the depth inside of that volume. Now what we really want to do is keep track of the best of these values. So let's go out here and define a couple more variables. Let's say float min depth, and let's just set this to some really high value so we know that it's going to have to sort of go lower. And we're also going to keep track of the primitive that it came from. So let's go int, we'll just call this index, and we'll start it as negative 1. So now what we want to do is say if the depth we just measured from this volume is less than our min depth, then let's update those two values. We'll say min depth now equals this depth, so that's our new best value. And our index is just b. In fact, let me go ahead and instead of this, I'm going to use a string. I'm going to go string piece, and we'll just start with none. And if we do find it, then we'll just set it. Instead of to v, we'll set it to ball name. So now we'll just have the piece name. Uh, I think that's going to be more useful. OK. So now once we've gone through this whole thing, whatever comes out at the end as being the min depth and the piece, well, that's sort of the piece is going to be the closest volume, because it's going to be the one that has the minimum depth, and depth is going to be the minimum depth that we were able to find. So we can just set those as attributes. So we're going to go at depth equals min depth, and specify a string name equals piece. So now if we look at our point geometry, we'll see we have names, and they should range from 29 down to 0, and we have these depth values, and they range from um, a little, basically 0, um, all the way down to negative 0.18. And if we were to just visualize this, so we could drop a color here, and we can just do a random from attribute and throw down name, you'll see we have basically our nice fractured pieces here. And if we were to just look at our Voronoi fracture, these should line up quite nicely. So there we go. So we recovered for each of these um, which piece it's from. And to understand what we're getting from depth and actually to help us to sort of pick some values we're going to need later, I'm actually going to set up a slightly different visualizer here. I'm just going to drop down a grid and let's put it in x, y, and we're going to make it the same size as the box. So it should be one by one and it should be up at 5. So 1 by 1, up at 5, and let's give this lots of resolution. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pipe this through here instead. And if we were to just visualize these pieces, this is backwards now, here we go. If we just visualize the pieces, we get sort of that same information, but what I actually want to visualize is our surface distance or our depth rather. So let's get a ramp from attribute. I'm going to put depth in here. By default this is 0 to 1. That's not what we want because we already saw if we look in these points we're going from basically 0 down to negative point sort of 1 8. So if I throw those values in here now you can see what we're getting and this is basically what the surface density function is doing is it's giving us these values that range from 0 at the surface and they get smaller and smaller as they get towards the middle. So these are our sort of maximum values in the interiors here. Now, to skip forward a little bit, what we're going to want to do in the flip simulation is we want to have basically these seams, so the regions between the faces that are between our chunks. These should be fluid with low viscosity, so it should be like really easy to deform. It should sort of flow around a lot. And as we get towards the interior, we want to increase our viscosity, so we want it to be thick and stiff on the interior here. So we want to figure out some mapping, and we want to figure out, okay, where do we want to start our sort of maximum viscosity, and where do we want the sort of uh, boundary and edge to be our minimum viscosity here. So let's go back to our parameters and just make a couple of new parameters for that. We're going to want two values for our min depth, and this is going to be basically the boundary for our lowest viscosity and we're going to want our max depth. 
and this will be the boundary for our maximum viscosity somewhere on the interior here. And I'm just going to go ahead and actually make these two extra variables right now, which are going to be min viscosity, and so that's going to be the lowest viscosity we use, and max viscosity. That'll be the highest one that we use. So I'm just going to apply that. I'm going to ignore viscosity for now, but let's just sort of dial in some of these depth values. So let me just copy this. We're just going to throw it right into here. I'm going to paste my minimum here. And I will do the same here and just call it max. Now, just to get a little bit more sort of fine grained here, let me just turn this into a little bit of like a flat body type of visualization. Like pick up yellow there. And I really want to emphasize that sort of upper boundary. So I'm going to actually change that color entirely. So now, if we start to dial in here, so if we go to those same values we had before, there we go. And you're seeing that we really don't hit that maximum very much. So I'm going to pull this down a bit. And I'm starting to like that. That's giving me these chunks in the middle here. If we want a bit lower, it sort of expands a bit farther out. But what we want to make sure, actually, is that we have a fair amount at the lowest uh, viscosity. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. But we really want to make sure that this band of the lowest value is relatively thick. So I'm going to sort of dial this in a bit. And that, I think, is giving me some nice sort of chunky lines here. I might actually even go a little bit farther, just because I know these values work nicely. I'm going to pull this back a little bit. And this may seem like a lot on the middle. We're losing a lot of our chunks. Um, but you'll actually see that it, it works reasonably well. And of course, you can kind of dial in different values here. But I think I'm actually going to go with this. So you can see now we've got these nice thick bands that are going to be separating our individual chunks. And then we've got a little bit of a ramp that's going to be moving from our minimum viscosity up to our maximum. And then in here is going to be sort of our maximum viscosity for like the internal really stiff parts of each chunk. OK. So now that we've got those parameters kind of locked down, let's actually convert them into viscosities. So let's drop another attribute wrangle here. And all I want to do is basically remap um, this depth into um, those values there. So let's say. Let's set a default viscosity. So this is going to be the minimum. So basically, if we don't do anything else, let's just say that our viscosity should be the minimum value. Um, so we're going to want to grab that from our parameters. So our minimum viscosity, let's just copy that parameter. I'm going to do the funny little trick and paste it into here so that it doesn't overwrite. And this is a float. So we can just copy that text there. So our minimum vis viscosity, so our default viscosity, is just going to be that minimum. Now we're going to say is the depth of this particle less than the minimum depth we're interested in. And I know that we call that min depth, so we can just throw that in here. So if our depth is less than that minimum, so that means it, it should be a different value than our minimum viscosity, we're just going to fit our viscosity using depth, and we're going to fit it from our minimum to our maximum depth. So let's just go min depth and max depth, and we're going to fit it to our min viscosity to our max viscosity. So we'll grab these parameters, min viscosity up to max viscosity. And I'll just put that closed, and now what we'll find is I've done something wrong, because I should not have zeros. Oh, of course I should have zeros, because we didn't set these parameters. Here we go. So for a minimum, um, we could use zero. Zero is a valid viscosity. That's basically like water, so it's going to flow really fluid, uh, smoothly. I want something a little higher, even for my minimum. I'm going to go up to four. And for my maximum, I'm going to go right up to a million. And that may seem like a really high value, um, but if you play around with viscosity a lot, You'll see that if you want it even remotely stiff, you need to be getting up into sort of 10,000, 100,000. If you want it to be quite stiff, you need at least a million. And since we only have these tiny chunks, and they're going to be subjected to a lot of sort of shearing forces and slippage, even at a million, you'll see we're going to get a fair amount of deformation of these clumps.
Um, so a million is just fine. If we start to go much higher than this, sometimes the solver is gonna choke a little bit. It'll still run, but it's gonna give you an error because basically its viscosity solve isn't going to converge. You're gonna have just wildly different variables. It's gonna ask for more substeps or something like that. This, in my experience, is gonna work okay. So this right here is our flip source, and we're pretty much ready to get into our solver here. So I'm just gonna drop this down, flip source, and just so we can see something while we're solving, let's just throw, um, let's just get some color on here. Let's do maybe our, uh, our random name coloring. So we can just color by pieces. And why not? Let's just add a, whoops, I don't want that. I want another color note. Um, let's just add an extra bit of color for our, uh, our sort of boundaries. So let's say if depth is greater than negative 0.02. So this isn't quite the boundary we're using, um, but in that case, let's just set that maybe to black. This should give us some, um, no? Ah, I'm set. Okay, there we go. Just make sure to specify that that's a point group. Um, by default, it sort of thinks of it as being, I guess, a primitive group by default. Um, and so we just wanna make sure that that's, that's gonna be a point group. Now, one last thing this is actually reminding me of, what you can see here on the bottom and on the top, and actually if we go over to this grid visualizer again, we've got this band on the outside that's gonna be all low viscosity, and that makes sense because we're basically taking depth and sort of the outer surface of our, of our Voronoi fracture here is going to be kind of the surface. It's gonna be zero for each of our pieces. And, you know, that's, that's okay, but it basically means we've got all of our pieces and they're kind of enmeshed in this big block of low viscosity. What I really want is actually for the outer pieces to come right to the edge um, and sort of be fully dense, fully viscous right at the edge and to only have this low viscosity kind of for the interior seams. So to do that, I'm just gonna go right back here before the fracture and I'm gonna drop another transform. And I'm still gonna scatter on the original size geometry so our fractured pieces are gonna be identical. All I'm going to do by scaling is basically make it so that the sort of outer pieces are a little bit bigger. They're all going to extend farther. And that means when we generate the volumes, because we're still only going to be generating our points on the inner one as well, when we check our volumes, they're all going to be sort of really far into the inside. So let's just drop a transform in here. I'm just going to not let that update on this transform. Um, we're going to do a scale, but this thing is sort of above the origin here. So if I just drop the scale now, it's gonna kind of move from where it was. So we wanna make sure to move our pivot and we're just gonna move our pivot to the centroid of the geometry that we're passing into this transform. So we'll just use dollar CEX, CEY, and CEZ. So that means that our transform is gonna be relative to the middle of this object. So now we can just sort of bump this up, make it a whole lot bigger. And we have the same fractures but what we're doing is we're basically just sort of giving these outer pieces, we're making them much, much bigger. So now, if we just go through and look at this little visualizer, there we go. Now our outer pieces are coming right to the edge here and our sort of seams in the middle, our sort of intervening sort of black low viscosity stuff is really just, um, it's not coming to the edges. It's not giving us that whole boundary. It's just going on the inside between each of these pieces. And that's more what I want. So if we go back to our flip source, there we go. Now our pieces are coming right to the edge. We only have this sort of, uh, these seams in between there. Great. Okay, so this is what we're gonna pass into flip. And just before we do that, I'm gonna give this something to collide against. Um, I know if we just drop it on the ground, it's not gonna be quite as interesting. So let's just make something, some small, simple thing for this to collide against. And I'm just gonna use a little box here. Um, let's just give it a small box and we'll move it sort of up somewhere. Sitting about there, maybe I'll make it a bit lower. Let's try 2.5. There we go, sort of halfway down, it's gonna run into this little box and that'll just give it something to collide against. So let's just drop a null. I'm gonna call this collision geo. And then I'm going to do another BDB from polygons. 
I'm going to go ahead and grab our particle separation. Just use that for the resolution. And I'll drop another null and just call this collision volume. Um, so in general, for flip sims, it's good to use volumes for your collisions. Um, actually, volumes tend to be nice for a lot of your collisions, for pyro, for flip. Um, so, you know, for a box, it was going to work pretty well regardless, but we might as well just go ahead and, and use that volume. So let's dive into DOPS. We'll drop the DOP network and jump inside. And we're going to need a few things. We're going to need a static object. That'll be our collider. We're going to need to merge that with the rest of what's going on. Uh, we're going to want some gravity, otherwise it won't do anything. Oops. Check that into the merge. We're going to want a flip solver. And of course, a flip object. Flip object. There we go. And we're actually not going to add anything else to this. So this is a really nice, simple network here. So we'll start with our collider. Let's just grab uh, what we can sort of look at. So that'll be our geometry. It's not deforming, so we don't have to worry about any of that. We do want to change these collisions. So we're going to use volume collisions. And our mode is going to be a volume sample. And then if we scroll down here, we have our proxy volume. And this is where we're going to, br where we're going to bring in that collision volume we made. So. That'll give us our collider here. Um, if we visualize that, you can see we've got our nice little collider volume, so that all looks good. Now we want to set up our flip object, and we're going to want to change this particle scale. So let's just go back to our parameters again, grab this, dive back inside, update that. Great. And then, of course, this is just its default geometry here. So let's go down into our initial data. Our input type is going to be a particle field because we basically generated all the particles we want. And the path to that field is just this flip source that we made. So if we bring that in here, you'll see it disappears there because it should be up here. Um, we're going to take care of this wonky viewport stuff in a second. Um, but first, I just want to do a couple more things here. I'm going to go ahead and change this particle visualization. I don't like the sprites. I just like to see my particles. And I actually don't even want to visualize speed or anything. I don't need that. I'm just going to keep the color that I piped in originally. So I'm going to turn this visualization off, just look at the particles. And that's basically what I want to see. The last thing I'll do in here is actually turn on closed boundaries. And the only one we're really going to use is sort of the negative y one. And we're going to use this as a ground. So instead of a ground plane, we're just going to use our volume limits. And that just gives us some free collision. So closed boundaries just means that the simulation will collide with the boundaries. Uh, if they're open, then when the simulation hits the boundary, the particles just disappear. They're, they're killed. They're removed from the simulation. When it's closed, they collide with the simulation. So we're going to use our negative y as, as our ground. So let's come over to the flip solver. Um, let's just deal with that volume first. So we'll go to volume limits here under the volume motion tab. And this box size, I don't really care about the x and the, uh, and the z. They're, um, yeah, it's never going to hit those limits anyway, and we don't really want it colliding with walls um, in, in sort of the horizontal directions. We really just care about why. And again, we don't even care about how tall that is. It's going to resize its field. It's not going to try to calculate this whole volume. So what we really just need to do is bring up the floor. So if we move this up by half of its height, that means the bottom of our box here is going to be sitting on the ground, and that'll give us a ground plane. Now, part of why the viewport is weird is because essentially we're interacting with this volume. Um, so instead of grabbing this, um, our flip simulation, we're grabbing the whole volume. We can get rid of that by just turning off this visualize limits. Now I can grab my flip sim and it'll actually behave nicely. So I'll just turn that off now that we have that set up. Pretty much the only other thing we need to do here is go to viscosity, enable it, and enable it by attribute. So if you just enable it, then you can go over to your flip object, and under physical, you can set a viscosity value here. We want it to change across these different pieces, so we want viscosity by attribute. We're going to keep mix as copy. Uh, this basically just says we're not going to sort of remember what the viscosity was in the last frame. We're just going to update our, uh, our grid every time. Keep viscosity scale as 1. And the last thing we want is to actually turn on slip on collision. If we don't have this on, then basically this stuff, because it's such high viscosity, it's going to stick to everything. And it's going to do some kind of funny things um, on this surface too. But it's basically just going to glom up and not really move around much. 
So I'm even going to bump up this slip scale a bit just to make sure that it can uh, it can really move around relatively freely. Now I do want to take just a moment to talk about what viscosity is doing here um, and to help you understand in particular why we want these relatively thick bands in between uh, these chunks. So you'll notice our viscosity information is under volume motion. So this is a volume property. Um, if you don't know much about flip, and I don't want to claim to be an expert here, um, but basically what flip is doing is it's trading back and forth between a particle representation and a grid representation or a, a voxel, a volume representation. And this is handy for particular types of solves like pressure that aren't really very easy to solve at the particle scale, um, but make a lot more sense on the voxel scale. You have individual sort of finite discrete compartments and you can really solve things like pressure projection in a grid format that you can't do easily on a particle format. So every step through this solver, what happens is all these particle values, if they have individual values of their position, their velocity, their viscosity, their density, all of that gets projected onto a grid. A bunch of solvers operate on the grid, and then that information is copied back onto the particles, and they're allowed to sort of eject and move, and it recedes if there isn't enough density, and so on and so forth. Viscosity is being calculated on the grid. It's a volume property. This isn't really a particle property. This is a volume property. Um, it's stored on the particles, but it's solved on the grid. And this is important because if we look at our flip object, our default grid scale here, this is saying how coarse is the grid representation relative to the particles that, uh, representation. The grid is by default a fair bit coarser. And that speeds things up, that makes RAM cheaper, that makes all the sort of volume solvers faster. And so it's kind of nice to keep this high. Um, a lot of people will bring it down to make things sort of better. Um, it'll make the solver essentially more accurate and more precise, um, but it'll be faster if you leave this up. And what that means is that when we're copying things over, if we just have a really thin band of low viscosity and it's surrounded by really, really high viscosity on either side, when we translate that to this coarser grid, we're basically just gonna lose the low viscosity. And what viscosity is fundamentally doing is saying, keep track of the relative positions um, of the geometry, of the particles, of the fluid, and don't let it change very much. It's basically resisting deformation. So if you have really high viscosity surrounding a tiny band of low viscosity, the low viscosity is just going to lose. Um, everything is going to be treated. The whole grid is going to update essentially as though it's all high viscosity. So we need to have a relatively thick band here. And this is also why I do the little ramp from the low viscosity to the high viscosity. We want to make sure there's enough um, representation coming in from the low viscosity that it actually gets solved at that sort of, uh, at that grid step. So let's take a look at what we've got. Uh, we can just go ahead and start this running. And we can see that this is working pretty nicely, actually. So I'll just stop that for a second. So you can see down here, we've had this whole piece fall off entirely. Um, you can see these other chunks are kind of splitting apart at the seams. Um, it's all sort of hitting and coming apart, but it's still sort of sticky and gooey, and we're getting this nice kind of fluid sort of mess coming through here. So if we bring this back out here, um, I'm gonna go ahead and under the object, just use star flip star. Basically what I'm saying is give me the, the flip object, not this static object. So we're gonna get rid of that collider. I know you can't see it in here anyway, but if I sort of skip back here, now you can see the collider's gone. If I grab everything, we get the collider as well. So I just want my flip information, and that's just gonna be my particles here. And you know, you could, uh, you could play around with a bunch of these values, you could change things a little bit, but for current purposes, I think this is looking pretty good. And you know, of course I cheated, I already had these values dialed in before we started, um, but you know, this is looking pretty good to me. But of course you can change this as you like. So we've got all these nice pieces coming apart. Um, we've got this good spreading here, but we've also got our individual chunks are really obviously staying together. So with this in mind, let's talk a little bit about um, shading, how you might approach that in this. And I'm not gonna dive too much into sort of our, uh, our mantra shaders and our settings there, but I do wanna talk about this a little bit because there's some aspects of fluid shading that can be a little bit tricky. So, if we go ahead and drop down a particle fluid surface, um, this is obviously going to be very coarse to begin with 
So let's just go up and grab again our particle separation. Put that in here. It's going to take a little bit longer, but still not very long. Um, so we get this surface here. And this is all right. Um, we can do a couple things to tweak this. Um, in my experience, I like to actually bring my influence scale up a little bit, um, sometimes even up to sort of four. That's just sort of how close is it looking for things. That'll smooth things out a little bit. Um, I also like to turn this limit refinement, um, what's the whole limit refinement iterations, um, to zero, which basically says it's not doing any refinement. And that doesn't sound good, but the reason is the refinement is part of why you get sort of popping with your flip meshes. So when you have sort of rapidly changing the flip and you get sort of weird sort of jitters and popping, some of that is because each individual time it generates the mesh, it does this refinement step and that ends up introducing sort of different artifacts. Um, so it's not quite as smooth when you don't have refinement on, but you do get, I find, a slightly more stable mesh from frame to frame. Um, other things, if you, especially if you do limit refinement, you can go to filtering and maybe turn on some of these smooths. I like the Laplacian one. Um, that will again smooth out some of those details a bit. And you're also potentially, if you're rendering in Mantra, surface polygon soup is good. If you're rendering anywhere else, you probably want this to be surface polygon, so you might as well just toggle that. So this is looking all right. Um, one more thing I'm going to do, it makes it a little bit more expensive. It'll be more geometry heavy. Um, you can see right now this adaptivity, it's at 0 0.005 by default, which is still relatively low. But what this is saying is sort of how different can the polygon sizes be? So if I really crank this up, you can see it's going to try to find regions that it can pad out with much larger polygons. We're going to get much lighter geometry this way. The problem with that is that if we try to put UVs on here, some of them are going to be really widely spaced, some of them are going to be really sort of finely spaced. I like to keep this relatively low and even all the way down at zero potentially. This just gives me a nice even sampling of points here. It means my UVs are going to be nice and easy, uh, evenly sampled. Now when it comes to this particular simulation, there's actually a lot of properties we can potentially work with. Um, so if we just think in particle terms for a minute, each of these particles has a lot of different values or a lot of different variables. Um, one of them we can maybe think about is where is it in the original geometry, in the initial geometry? So is it a surface point or is it an interior point for the entire whole initial box? Uh, so that's one piece of information. We might want it, say, darker on the outside, lighter on the inside. Um, there's a lot of things we could do there. Uh, so we can try to get some of that information in here. Um, we know its individual piece numbers, so we could give sort of different values like we have here in this very sort of basic visualization. Um, we could give different shader properties to the pieces versus sort of the uh, uh, the sticky stuff in the middle here. Um, we also know the depth within the pieces, so maybe we want to shade uh, sort of light to dark or something, give, give a ramp for uh, outside of pieces to inside of pieces instead of the entire box. Uh, those are properties we have. Um, but no matter how much of we do of that we do, and we're still we're going to get some sort of nice effects if we start to put some of that through here, we're still stuck with the fact that this is going to look kind of bland. Um, our basic sort of particle fluid surface is always going to be relatively smooth, relatively bland, unless you've like really cranked up your uh, your particle resolution, and that's going to be a really expensive simulation. Um, I don't have a supercomputer to run this on. Uh, if you do, awesome. Um, but this sort of surface is always going to end up a little bit bland. And one of the most obvious ways to fix this is to put something like a bump map or displacement on it. But for that, we need UVs. Um, we need some way to get a smoothly, uh, a nice set of UVs on here. And the first way you might think about this is, well, let's just UV our original positions, and then we can just sort of transfer those and propagate them all through. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that would look like. I'm going to go ahead and do that uh, really early on. And I'm going to do one extra thing here as well. I'm going to get that distance from the surface. And so let's just do a VDB from polygons again. I'll make it sort of nice and high resolution. And we're just going to do a very simple volume sample here. And I'm going to call this something like, let's just say, main depth. This will just be volume sample one surface at p. And so this is just going to give us a value right at the beginning. Um, how deep within this overall box is it? So not how deep within each piece, but how deep within the entire bounding geometry. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do here, and maybe I'll just do, let's just 
call this uh, rest info. Uh, the other thing I'll do in this node is just say v at, I'm going to call this any pause for initial position is our current position. Um, so this isn't a UV, but we can use it to map UV. And in general, it's easier to sort of propagate your, your rest position, which has sort of maximal information, and later make your UV mapping than to map your UV at the beginning, because if you change your mind, well, there's nothing you can do about it later. But if you have the positions, you can always reconstruct and remap your UV. So let's just pass that information through. And now if we jump inside of our dotnet, on our flip solver by default, and I recommend it for this because we're going to have these like sticky tendrils coming out, um, you're going to want to have reseeding on. And in fact, especially for viscous simulations, a lot of folks will recommend bumping up these values, potentially quite a lot, like up to 4, 8, 16, really change this bandwidth even up to 2, 3, 4. This will give you lots and lots of extra particles. Uh, it can give you really nice looks, especially when you have thin tendrils. I'm not going to do that right now because it does slow things down. Um, but if you're doing like a final sim, I would probably recommend boosting these at least a little bit. And um, that'll get you lots of extra particles. But what reseeding is doing is sort of asking, where do I not have enough particles? Let's add a new one. And when we add a new one, well, where does its values, where do its values come from? Um, by default, it can just take the nearest particle. That's what it'll give you for sort of most attributes. But we can also specify some attributes we want it to interpolate. And what we mean by that is it'll just look at nearby particles and it'll try to find like a weighted average of those uh, particles for those values. So we just made our main depth and our any pose, um, so our rest position, so let's put those into the interpolate. And that'll just give us a slightly smoother sampling of those values. So I'll go any pose and main depth. So if we pipe those through, now our reseeded particles will have those uh, sort of averaged. And I'm just going to sort of come over here and maybe we can just look at some, oh boy, what did I just drop? Color adjustment. Okay, that's fine, but I don't need it. Okay, let's just drop, say, a color. Let's just look at our particles here. So if we run this through, let's just let it drop a little bit so it starts to come apart. Now we have some new values that we can work with. Um, so we could use main depth. Uh, so we could do a really simple ramp, for example. So we could ramp from main depth, and this ranges from, I don't know what, this ranges from presumably zero to, ah, I did something foolish here. You'll remember for our pieces, we ticked on this fill interior because we want our depth to basically make it all the way to the middle. Um, I forgot to do that here. That means our minimum depth is just going to be three interior bands times this voxel size. So our minimum depth is negative 0.03. I want to fill this interior. So let's just go back here, run this forward again. Okay, and now if we look at our main depth, that ranges down to negative 0.5. So if we put that in here, now we're getting kind of a nice effect, whereas it sort of ruptures open, we get this brighter material on the inside. Um, so that's kind of fun, so that's the sort of thing we can look at. Um, but we were talking about UVs, so let's take a look at this any pose value. If we go into our particle fluid surface here, what we can do when we create the surface is transfer attributes from the particles. So let's transfer our initial position. And I'm going to drop out vorticity. We, do, we don't need that for anything at this point. So if I've done that, I now have my initial positions here. And what I'm going to do with those is something really kind of basic here, um, but good enough for present purposes. I'm going to say my UV is going to be my any pose. And if we do this, um, I'm going to do I'm going to kind of fake UV just so we can look at things in the viewport here. Um, so you'll you'll see why I'm doing this in a minute. Um, instead of just doing like a UV quick shade or something, I'm going to do it on a sort of particle by part or a point by point basis, um, just so that we don't have to go into rendering over and over again. Uh, but basically, bear with me for a minute here. Uh, let's just specify a file name. I'm going to make that a string channel. Create that. Uh, so that'll put that down here. What we can then do is go into our parameters, select that file name we made, and set our type. You know, string is fine, it's true, but 
we have these nice things like files here, which is what we actually want, and I want an image. So let's grab an image here, go apply and accept. And I'm gonna go ahead and just pick uh, something from maybe Houdini's own sort of images. So let's just go to Houdini pick texture. Everybody's got this and maybe I'll grab bricks. So now what we can do is basically say the color of our point, we're gonna use color map uh, and this will basically look up file and we pass it a UV and it just finds the color there. So if I do this, um, you can see our UVs are mapped on this side. They're, they're really blurry because we don't have a lot of points here. Uh, but we've got our UVs on this side. I don't like this very much. If I'm just being really sort of cheap and boring with my UVs, what I'll do is just say, my first two UVs, let's just add um, my second UV. Because we're not actually gonna read from, um, sorry, the third UV, we're not gonna read from our Z. Um, so basically I wanna say, depending on where I am in depth, let's offset these first ones. And this just gives us like a diagonal mapping of the texture along the other faces, but it means that everywhere in depth, we have a UV value. And because we're dealing with particles um, and they're spread out in depth and we've mapped them from the rest position, we kind of need UVs everywhere in depth. So I find this is sort of a straightforward way of doing that. Now, if we move forward here, um, you'll see pretty quickly, and let me, let's just move our simulation forward a bit farther. Okay, so if we get to say this point, and we generate our surface, and we put our textures on here, you can see it's become kind of just already a distorted mess, like this looks bad. Um, we can maybe try to improve this if we threw down like a subdivide. We can get a few more points on here, we can up our point density. Um, and that fixes it a little bit, but still this is kind of a mess. Um, so if we're just going on the basis of our original UVs, very quickly it's going to turn into a bit of a nightmare. And if you're trying to use this for bump mapping or displacements, uh, it's, it's just not going to look very good. It's going to start to get way too distorted. Um, so the fundamental thing that we're fighting against when we're trying to UV fluid simulations is this distortion, is the fact that the original rest position, a particle, two particles that are nearby can end up really far apart. And so they used to have close by UVs, but by later on they have really distant UVs and it just makes the whole thing uh, turn into a bit of a chaotic mess. So if that approach doesn't work, well, what can we do instead? Well, you'll notice on this particle fluid no uh, surface node, we have these two defaults, rest and rest two. And you may have always wondered what are those doing there? I don't even see them in my attributes here. And the reason is you have to enable those. But these two rest positions are actually sort of positions and they define or they let us do what we call a dual rest projection. So first things first, let's head on inside to, uh, to DOPS and let's enable this. So I'll just go back to the beginning here. I don't want to be in there because it's slower. Okay, so let's just go back inside. And you'll see on our particles here, way at the end we have rest. And we can just say add rest attribute. And by default, it's going to do dual rest attributes. So what dual rest is basically doing is it's going to keep track of two versions of a point's rest position. And these aren't the original rest positions, instead they get updated at regular interval intervals. So this frames between reset is sort of how long, how many frames do you go before you reset these rest positions. And the reason we have two of them is because we re reset them in a staggered way. So rest position one will update at 50, rest position two will update halfway through, it'll update at 25. And so what we're doing is we're basically getting new rest positions regularly throughout the simulation. And the reason we do this is because, as I was saying before, nearby points at the beginning might end up really far apart. But if we reset their rest positions, then if they're close together, then they're close together. If they're far apart, they're far apart. So we're basically trying to sort of get rid of every 50 frames or so, we're getting rid of um, that kind of distortion and we're just reprojecting our UVs. Now, the problem with this and the reason we need two of these and the reason they're offset is because if we just went to 50 and then reset our UVs, we would have this big dramatic popping in what we looked at. As soon as we hit frame 50, we're suddenly resetting where all of our rest positions are, we're gonna reset our UVs, it's gonna look awful. It's gonna be very, very obvious. What we do instead is we have these offsets. So rest one updates at 50, rest two updates at 25. 
when rest one is updating, we only show UVs based on refs two. When rest two is updating, we only show UVs based on rest one. In between, we blend between the two. So what we're doing is we're constantly basically resetting one UV in the background while we're using the other, and then we blend gradually towards the new one while we reset the other one, and then we blend gradually towards it while we reset, and we keep resetting basically while being masked by the other rest position. What this means is that our UVs are constantly sort of smooth. They're constantly sort of nearby. They're limited in their distortion because we only have 50 frames worth of motion before they're ending up sort of drifted apart. Um, and they're sort of constantly blending in between each other. Now, this still isn't going to work that well for really dramatic textures. So if we use those bricks, for example, it's got a lot of high contrast edges. You're going to see the blend. But if you're doing something like nice high frequency noise, like bump mapping, this is actually going to work pretty well. Now, I'm going to go ahead and actually drop this value down a little bit just so we can see it more easily. Um, this is something you kind of need to dial in based on the speed of your simulation, the scale of your simulation, the textures you're using. Um, but I'm just going to drop this down so we can actually take a look. So let's just drop that to 30. So now if we run this for a little bit. Okay, so we've gone through here. And the first thing you'll notice if we look at our geometry, we now have rest and rest2. So these variables now exist. The next thing you'll notice, so I went up to sort of um, 30, or sorry, 60 frames. So our reset was in periods of 30. So we basically had sort of two, re two resets worth. Um, these particles, I don't think I put IDs on them. Uh, so for reseeding, we're going to see some other changes here. Uh, but if we look at our rest positions, you can see that as we move, our initial rest is not changing until we hit 30. And then, actually it's waiting until about 32 for some reason, but basically it's not changing until around 30. Then we're getting an update here, but you'll see that this one, rest 2, doesn't change when that one updates. And so now this one is static until we hit probably about 45. And now rest 2 updates while rest one stays the same. So as we move through, basically every 15 frames, one or the other of them is going to sort of update, and they're going to toggle back and forth. So what we want to do is basically blend between these resting positions um, on the basis of where we are in these frames. Now, in theory, there's supposed to be a detail attribute uh, that tells us the ratio between these rest scales. Uh, I've never found it. It doesn't seem to exist as far as I can tell. Um, so we're going to have to compute that ourselves, but that's no big deal because we know what our sort of uh, spacing is, so we can just generate our own rest blend here. So let's go ahead and do that first and drop an attribute wrangle. We're going to start and we're going to do this on particles, but then we'll transfer it over to our particle fluid surface. Uh, it's just we don't have to wait for this to keep updating. So let's do this on particles, and in fact I'll go ahead and grab this color that we had. So there we go, we can map our bricks onto here. And of course it doesn't look like anything because we've gone all the way forward to sort of frame 50. But if we come up here, you can sort of roughly see this brick information. Okay, so let's take a look at these rest positions. We want a rest ratio. And this is basically gonna be defining where are we between rest one and rest two. And we want this to sort of smoothly vary from 0 to 1 to 0 to 1 to 0 to 1 in a regular period. And so the best kind of function to use for that is going to be a nice periodic function. Our options, of course, are sine and cosine. Um, sine starts at 0, cosine starts at 1. I am going to use cosine. And the reason is we want it to be at sort of the peak of one of its things when we start. Um, so if we're using cos, it's going to give us a value between negative 1 and 1. Uh, we want a value between 0 and 1, so let's just say fit cos, and we haven't put anything in there yet, but it's going to go from negative 1 to 1. We'll remap that from 0 to 1. Okay, so what goes in here? Well, we want to know where our frame is uh, in these sort of 30 frame intervals. So we want something like frame over 30. Um, that's going to give us sort of where are we in our 30 frame intervals. Um, this isn't going to be quite enough, though, because cos expects radians. So let's just multiply this by 2 times pi. So if we throw this through, um, we'll get a rest ratio. And this ratio, where are we here? You'll see at the beginning, it's going to be basically 1 once we hit 30. And you'll remember 30 is basically where our first rest is being upset. Um, so at this point, we want to be using rest 2 predominantly. 
And so sure enough, our rest ratio is nice and high here. As we get towards 45, our rest ratio goes to zero. And this is where we're updating two, so we wanna be using one. So this is perfect. So when we're updating two, our rest ratio is zero, so that's gonna to be towards rest one. And when we're updating, oops, I wanted to simulate a little bit more, there we go. Um, when we're updating rest position one, our rest ratio is up near one. Um, so we're gonna be updating, uh, we're gonna be sort of using predominantly two. So we're gonna use this rest ratio to blend between our two rest positions. Now there's two ways you might think about doing this. I'll start with the wrong one, because uh, it was the first one that I thought I was supposed to do, and it took me a bit to sort of sort out what I was doing wrong. Um, so we'll say UV1 is going to be just rest, and UV2 is going to be rest2. And I'll do that same sort of um, uh, funny UV mapping I did here. So let's just do that for both of these. these and then what we can do is say our overall UV is going to be a linear interpolation between UV1 and UV2 based on rest ratio. Now what we can do is use this UV um, to do our color lookup here. So let me just even make this an attribute. We can go down here and just bring that in instead. So if we do this, um, we should be getting a kind of blending between our two UVs. But you'll see that this does not look particularly good. And we can kind of highlight this if we go over and look at our particle fluid surface instead. So let's just pipe this through. So now if we look around 28 and then get to 30, we're seeing kind of this weird flickering. It's almost worse than it was before. Um, so this is definitely not smoothly interpolating um, the way that we want. And the reason is we don't actually want to be interpolating the UVs. What we want to do is use each UV to look up our texture and then interpolate those textures. So what I'm going to do here instead is say UV1, let's just turn these into attributes, UV2, and then down here what I'll do is I'm going to look up a color from my first UV, and I'm going to look up a color from my second UV, and I'm going to interpolate those colors UV2 using, again, that rest ratio value. Now if we do this, um, we're going to probably need to get this subdivide back in here to make it look like anything. So let me just throw that back in here. Get some more points on there. Um, if we do this, you can start to see it's still pretty um, dis disoriented here. We're right in the middle of the two, though. And you can see that we have this kind of overlaid appearance here. Um, so we have sort of one high contrast value, or sort of two sort of low contrast textures. And if I go to sort of just around 30, it's a lot more sort of high contrast. We just have the one value. And if I go up to sort of uh, just after 60, again, it's going to be that, that same amount. What we're doing is we're sort of transitioning between these two textures. But you can see that right here, even way up at 60, we have a lot more sort of regularity in how this stuff is distributed. Um, it's still pretty sort of uh, fine grained down in these areas. It's still getting broken up quite a lot because this is a pretty disrupted simulation. Um, but you can see we actually have a lot of fairly clean UVs in here. So even later on, we're still getting this. And um, this isn't going to sort of play back smoothly because it has to do all of its meshing and things. But if you were to watch this, you would see that it basically transitions fairly smoothly every 30 frames from one sort of UV set to the other, and it blends back and forth between the two. Now, this brick texture is pretty high contrast, um, so you're still going to notice a little bit of that fade. It's not quite as bad as a popping, but you will still notice the fading here. But if this was something like a sort of rough bump map, uh, if we used instead of, say, our brick's base color, maybe we use our dirt, uh, maybe our dirt roughness, for example, um, this is already a fairly broken up texture. You're never really going to notice those transitions.
So in this way, you're always going to get some nice smoothly changing and flowing with your geometry uh, information coming through here. Now, the last thing you might want to do to get this um, looking even better here, right now what we're doing when we do this attribute transfer here is we're basically sort of checking nearby points. And this attribute radius, he radius here is actually in sort of uh, voxels, I believe. Um, multiplier and particle separations, rather. So not the voxels themselves, but the particle separation. So this is a relatively small value. And so what it's doing is it's only looking at points within, I guess it's going to be basically 0.06 of, uh, of the particle on the surface. So it's going to generate this surface. And then it's just going to sort of bring its particle, its attributes in. So v, rest, rest2, and any pose. It's going to bring these attributes in just from those nearby points. And it's only going to check 10 of them. So right now, some of the breakup that we're still getting down here is coming through because this just is not enough. And in general, when you're doing, especially for this sort of rest blending, but honestly, I find for almost any attribute I'm trying to bring back to my, uh, to my fluid surface, you really want to bump up these values a lot. So I'm going to take this one probably up even to 8. So I want to look like a lot of particles nearby. Um, oh, I've still got subdivide here. I'm just going to start with this. Uh, so I'm going to look at a lot of the nearby particles, and I'm going to sample just tons of them. I'm going to bump this just way up. Um, I also maybe want some of my other properties on here. So I want my main depth, and I want my depth. There we go. Let's get everything going through there. So if we resample all of that stuff, subdivide on here. We'll just take it a second. Now when we do our mapping, it should be a little bit smoother. Um, and you might be able to see that. Yeah, I think you can even see that down in these areas here compared to what it was before. I wonder if I can do a side by side easily. Uh, not very. It's, it's going to sort of lose track of what the previous frame was if I try to do a side by side. Um, but hopefully you can see that this actually kind of smooths out a lot of these properties here. And if you ramp this up even more, um, we can even go to, uh, let me just, I'm going to switch that to manual so I can update a couple things. Let's even sort of bump this up quite a lot. This is probably more than I normally would, um, but just to show, and hopefully once it's updated here, you can see even in these areas down here where it was pretty messed up, we're starting to get some nice continuous lines here. So if you really crank up some of this smoothing in particular for the attribute transfer, um, then you really start to get all those major benefits uh, from this sort of dual UV blend here. And even if we went back to, say, those high contrast bricks we had before, let me just pull that in again. You can see we're actually getting some really nice uh, sort of texturing down here. So a lot of that breakup we were seeing before is really just coming through from not sampling widely enough and not smoothing enough. So if you really do smooth out your UVs, you can actually get quite nice uh, mapping of these fluids. And again, this is going on throughout the simulation. So if I come back to, say, some earlier frame here, pretty much no matter where I go, it's going to be moving smoothly through here. Um, but it's going to be updated. So here you can see how it's blending between the two. So you can see the overlay, but this overlay is going to be blending smoothly. So if we didn't have these really high contrast lines, um, you probably wouldn't notice that much at all. So this has a pretty nice look. Now, obviously, if you're actually shading this, if you were really rendering this, you don't want to be storing this information on, on the points. So you don't want to be just like computing your point colors and passing that into the shader and, and calling it a day because I mean, first of all, we have to do the subdivide step, which gets expensive, and we're going from an already pretty, I mean, that's not super heavy, only sort of 100,000 points. Once we subdivide, we're up to 1.5 million points, though. So we're really taking kind of a modest geometry and turning it into a relatively heavy one. And so if we start with a heavy geometry, this is just going to be way too many points. Uh, so we don't want to do that step, um, but you can see we need it if we're going to try to do that point coloring at all. But what the shader is going to do is it's just going to look, if we go back to our wire shaded here and just take those colors off, it's going to look at UVs on these vertices, and it's, it's going to interpolate the colors in the middle on its own. So what I'm showing here isn't how you should do it. Um, you want to set this up in the shader. You basically want to look up your texture using each of these two UVs and then interpolate inside the shader from those two texture calls. Um, I don't really want to get into the mantra shaders and how to set that up. I usually render um, in Redshift. So it's a little bit easier to do material blending there. Um, so I don't want to turn this into a shader tutorial. So basically, if you were actually going to render this, what you need to do with this dual rest is inside your shader, 
you need to look up your texture twice, once for each UV, and then you need to blend it using this rest ratio. So I would just go from this step, I would do a quick attribute transfer, and I would, oops, that's not what I want, I would do a quick attribute promote, and I would just take my UV1 and UV2, and I would transfer those from points to vertices. And so this would be the geometry I would pass out to my shader. And you can see on each vertice, we have UV1 and UV2. And you could even, I suppose we should probably transfer our, our uh, rest, what do we call it? Rest, rest blend, rest ratio, rest ratio. You can transfer that as well. And so now in the shader, you can basically look up for each vertex. You can do your two different texture reads and blend those based on your rest ratio. And that's how you would get your final shader there. Now the last thing I'd like to do is actually just show one quick variant on, uh, on this setup that can give you a, a similar look, um, but some extra sort of features, extra properties um, that you might prefer. So let me just go back to our particle view here. Um, if we're dealing with our sort of particles here, um, I guess, yeah, this is our depth visualization again. Um, as you watch this through, these pieces sort of come apart, they glom together, um, they really sort of still stick a lot. And this can be a really kind of interesting look, and if this is what you're going for, then this can work really nicely for certain effects. But potentially you want sort of some of the fluid aspects, but you still want the actual destruction simulation to be more like a regular rigid body simulation. So the other version I'm going to show you really quickly, and it's actually in many ways a lot easier than this one, um, is just a way to have it a little bit more controlled. And so instead of doing everything inside of Flip, what we're going to do is we're going to basically going to make a, uh, a driving simulation using a regular rigid body simulation, and we're just going to drive Flip using that. And so we'll get kind of a different effect, um, but sort of a, a similar type of effect. So let's just quickly look at how we would do that. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go back to frame one here, come back out to my objects, and we're going to do a whole lot of the same stuff here. So I'm just going to go ahead and go to manual. Um, whenever you're copying something large, it's good to set your update to manual. Um, you don't, it'll get really sort of confused if you try to do it otherwise. Uh, so I'm just going to copy and paste this whole thing. And let's call this Flip Fracture RBD. And we're going to dive inside. And we're going to sort of change some of these steps here. I'm going to keep this same collision, but I don't need... Actually, no, I'll, I'm going to keep this. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and what we really want to do now is take this geometry here and let's see okay yeah we, we want to do this in, in a couple different ways okay so I'm going to take this Voronoi fracture I want to use these same scatter points but I don't want to use this scaled version because you'll remember the reason we scaled this was just to get uh, the pieces copied over on these points here so I don't want the scaled version for my simulation, I want to bring in that regular one. So let's just start with this fractured geometry. I'll go back to auto update. Um, I don't know why it's still trying to go through everything. Oh yes I do, okay. Let's just turn this off so it's not trying to show that in the background and just work in this thing. So here's our fractured geometry. And we're just going to do a very standard sort of workflow um, for a rigid body simulation. And in fact, for this, I'm not even going to glue it together. I'm, I'm just going to let it fall. I'm not even going to do any constraints. I just want to show you the workflow. So let's just quickly assemble this. We're going to create pack geometry. It's already got names, so we don't need to do that. So here we go. We've got our points, and they've got their names. That's all good. I'll drop a null here and call this RBD Geo. There we go. So now let's drop a dot network, and we're just going to do a very basic RBD sim. I'm going to put a ground plane. I'm going to grab a static object, a merge, some gravity. Uh, we're going to want our rigid body solver and an RBD packed object. Let's just wire all this together. Static gravity pipe the solver through there, and our packed object through here. Ground plane's fine. Static object is just going to be that collision geo we had. 
Um, we don't really want to use the volume version, we'll use this geometry. Uh, what you can do though under collisions, by default, it's going to use a convex hull, but this is a box, so we can actually just use a box. That'll give it a very nice clean geometry. So you can see it's just a perfect box there. So we'll do that for there, and then we'll just bring in our geometry. And that's this. And if we go ahead and run this, simplest simulation in the world, there we go. Falls apart. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this destruction to drive our flip simulation. So let's take a look at that. What we're going to want to do now is basically take all of this initial information from these points. It's going to take it a second to go through this volume update. So here we have all of our points and they each have an associated piece because we already set that up. We didn't actually use it very much except for visualization last time. In this version we're going to need this information quite a lot. So we have these names, uh, we have the depth within the piece, and we have their sort of initial position and overall main depth. But really we just care about the name and the depth here. And what we're going to do, before we made one whole fl uh, flip simulation and we basically said these guys are viscous and these guys are not viscous. Now what we want to do is say these guys in the interior, they're going to be following our rigid body simulation. They're going to be copying the information from this simulation. And then the stuff in between is just going to sort of follow along. So we're going to have basically unupdated fluid in here that's just going to follow in normal sort of fluid simulation ways. And then the stuff in the middle, we're actually going to update using this RBD sim data. So to do that, we're going to go ahead and come into here. Here we've got our, we're calculating our minimum depth and pieces, so that's fine, we want to keep that. But then instead of setting viscosity, what we're going to do instead here, and we can just recycle most of this, I'm going to say if the depth is less than that minimum depth. Um, and in fact, I think that's probably not even quite what I want. I think I want it to be probably somewhere in the middle here. So let's say our transition depth Maybe we'll even go right down to the maximum depth. So we're just going to keep these blue parts. So everything else is going to follow along, just the blue parts uh, we're going to have actually locked to the RBD. So we're going to go if it's less than our max depth. So if our depth is less than max depth, let's just give this some attribute. Let's say I at following equals one. And this is just going to tell us that this particular point should be following um, along to something else, and we're going to pass that extra data. The other thing I'm going to want, and I'll just throw it into this wrangle as well, once we start reseeding, we're going to start getting new points. Um, but we're going to be updating this geometry based on its initial points, so I actually want to give these sort of uniquely identifying attributes. So let's just do that here, and let's just say I at, and I'll just say uh, FID for, for flip ID, doesn't really matter, is just going to be PT none. So here we're just sort of storing the particle number, and it's exactly the same at the moment for these particles, but once we start reseeding and losing particles, these numbers won't necessarily line up, so this is going to be a way to make sure that we're checking our sort of uh, our follow geometry in the right way. Okay. So we can pipe the same information in here, into flip, but what we want to do now is have some geometry to sort of follow. We want it to update. And the way we can do that is by grabbing our simulation data from DOP. So we're going to do a DOP import, and we're going to grab from that network, and we're going to grab that RBD object. And what we want is just to uh, create points to represent objects. And we can use this along with transform pieces. And so normally we think about transform pieces as basically saying, well, we're just going to take um, um, we're going to take like geometry, like high resolution geometry, and, and replace that with our low resolution sim geometry. But we can really put anything here. Um, it can be just about anything we want. And it just needs to have this matching attribute here. So what we can do is take these points and basically say, first of all, let's split out. Um, yeah, let's split out the ones that are following. So we want a point group and we want to delete non-selected. 
Um, it's not recognizing, oh, of course, because it's not a group that I made. That's fine. So we just want at following equals zero. So let's delete those ones. So this will just give me these chunks that should be following my individual pieces. So these are the interiors of all of those chunks before. Um, and this is, maybe these are actually smaller than I wanted. Now that I take a look at this, let's see if we did min depth. So now that's that's a lot more, and we're still going to have quite a few pieces on the interior here. So maybe I'll, I'll use this instead. So we're going to use um, min depth for this. So these are the pieces that are actually going to be following. And what we now want to do is basically transform these by these template points. Now, I believe if we just pipe this straight in, it's probably not going to work quite right because the name is on the points here, and I think it expects it on the primitives. Oh, actually, no, no, it works just fine. There we go. So you can see now we just have our points, and they're following that simulation. And so what we can do now is we can take these transformed points, and each of these has its original ID, and that means we can take the stream within our simulation, and it can look up these transformed parts and say, this is where I should be. This is where I should be on these points. So let's just drop a null here. We're going to call this match positions. And finally, let's just dive into our .NET, our fluid simulation .NET. Uh, it's trying to solve. Let me go back to zero. There we go. And I'm just going to cut off these. OK, so if we drop into here, now what we're going to want to do, what's it angry about? Yes. So the first thing we have to do is basically say that um, we don't want viscosity by attribute anymore because we're not giving it an attribute anymore. So that's what it was complaining about there. Um, instead, we're just going to set that right on this physical tab. And I do want a relatively high viscosity. If you make it really low, basically you're just going to have following points and the rest is just going to fall down. If we give it a nice high viscosity, then it's still going to stick. It's all going to sort of glom together and pull apart in a nice way. So now all we have to do is basically feed in those position updates. And we can do that with a really simple just a buffer angle. And that's all we need to do. So I'm going to pipe that into here. I'm going to go to its inputs. I'm going to take the first input is myself, and the second input is going to be a SOP. And we're just going to point that second input to match positions. So now if we look at the wrangle, what we'll say, and we can even set a group here. This group will just be following, follow, oh, oh boy, following equals one. So we're just going to look at the points that are supposed to be following. And what we're going to do is we're going to find the matching point from that geometry stream. So we'll go int, uh, let's call it match point equals find attribute val. We're looking at geometry stream one, so our second input. Uh, we're looking at a point attribute, and that attribute is FID, and we want to match it to our current FID. So basically, we're just going to find the matching point in our sort of transformed stream here for each of our points in the actual simulation stream. So once we've found that point, we're just going to grab its position. So that's point 1, P, match PT, and I'm going to grab its velocity as well. So that's going to be point 1, V, match PT. Because you'll see when these points get transformed here, they're actually getting velocities. Not on frame 1, but if I go to frame 2, you can see they have these velocities being copied over. So these points um, aren't just getting positions, they're actually getting velocity transforms as well. So if I take that information in here, I can basically just update this particle. And that is basically all that we have to do here. So now if we run this, What you'll see, initially it's just falling, because this is basically on the same time scale. Um, nothing has really changed here. Um, you are seeing a little bit of sort of it's, kind of, it's kind of sucking in a little bit here, um, although not too much. And I think a lot of this is reseeding, is what we're seeing here. Um, so you see, as they start to come down, once they fracture, now you see these pieces actually pulling apart. And you can see that they're dragging some of this other fluid behind them. Now, a lot of the reason they're dragging this colored fluid is because they're actually doing some reseeding, um, but these reseeded particles aren't sort of keeping those same point match attributes. 
um, and the color is also getting sort of interpolated here. But you can see as we fall apart, those internal fluids are actually sort of drawing apart these individual tendrils here. And so this gives kind of an interesting look. Now, what I don't like is it still seems to be falling a little bit too quickly and a little bit too much. And you can see that there's some of these pieces here that aren't getting sort of anything being stuck to them. Some of this is because we just don't really have enough particle resolution here. Um, so that's one thing we can try to update. The other reason, and sort of the major reason though, is that at a natural speed, these individual RBD pieces over here in our RBD sim, they're just moving too quickly. Um, so if we're expecting our points to catch up with this and not just sort of move with it, but actually sort of drag along their neighbors, we really need to slow this down quite a lot. Um, so the way that this works best in my experience here, what you could do is retime this and then just really amp your, uh, your sub-steps on your flip simulation. But I figure if you're going to do all the extra calculation on those sub-steps, you might as well just have it available to look at as well. You might as well just slow the whole thing down. As long as you've got the cache space, um, it's sort of, hey, why, why not store a nice slow-mo version and you can speed it up if you need to, as opposed to just storing out um, your sort of uh, sub-stepped version. So instead of upping the sub-steps here, what I'm going to do is just slow down my base simulation. So we can go to simulation here and we can just use scale time. So let's go to say a quarter time. So we watch this, now we get a nice slow simulation here and it fractures much more slowly. These pieces are moving apart at a much more sort of uh, slow pace. So if I use this and we go back to our flip sim, it's going to take it a second to run through here. And now we see right away that um, we don't actually want the forces that we're putting on here. Um, that's sort of a mistake on my part, I think. These forces on gravity here are basically, and this, this is why maybe you would consider sub-stepping, uh, but we can fix it on our own. Uh, these forces on gravity here are basically four times as strong as the ones on here. And that's because these ones are updating based on this really slow simulation, and these ones are updating in sort of normal time, uh, as we might call it. So we could scale the time on this simulation as well. I'll just show you that. In this case, our forces should be sort of lined up, and now you can see it's not pulling apart the same way. So now if we look, we're getting a lot more of these nice tendrils. We're basically getting all of these pieces are being connected here. Um, we have this little one that lost sort of uh, what it was attached to, but almost everything else is getting these nice wispy tendrils sort of pulling them together here. Um, if we go back into our settings here and just take a look quickly at our receding. Um, I've bumped this a little bit. I'm going to bump it a little bit more. And this is basically going to give me sort of a lot of extra particles as they start to pull apart. That's going to help to maintain some of those wispy bits. I'm also going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to pull this back down. Um, I'm going to pull my minimum depth, I'm going to maybe push that down to 0.08. Um, that's not changing anything here, but if we look at sort of this visualization, now we should be getting like lots and lots of the stuff in the, in the middle. And I actually want a lot more of that kind of interior material. I think that's going to help that. Um, so those are two things I'm going to do. Uh, I had one other thing I wanted to do, which was actually just to boost our resolution a little bit. Um, I'm going to drop that to 0.024. So that's going to be an initial count of 70,000 points. I've kind of doubled the points at the outset. So if we take all that together and maybe even boost our viscosity a little, I'm kind of just tweaking these values here. Now if we run this, Yeah, so this this is starting to look really good to me. I'm, I'm liking this. So if we see this, we hit, and we kind of pull apart, but we have these nice sort of wisps that are almost showing us like motion trails. Uh, so this gives us the same original dynamics as a normal RBD sim, uh, but we now we have this nice sort of fluid kind of gooey set of motion trails here. And you can see our collision object is still kind of pulling it all apart there, um, but we're getting this nice flow and this nice sort of interesting sort of uh, branching structure here.
And of course, all of our same workflows that we were uh, sort of showing before still apply here. So we still have our sort of uh, distance-based blend here. Um, that's coming through just fine. So you can see those sort of interior parts are having that sort of cooler set of colors. Um, or we can do kind of our UVing, um, which obviously doesn't look like much. But you can see even here, um, we have these nice sort of fairly regular bands. And if we sort of drop back into our particle fluid surface, let that update, um, we get this nice sort of branching structure. And if we pipe this through, give it a second to do its subdivision. If we bring that through and put those UVs on there, you can see we get this really nice UVing, even for this sort of relatively more complicated structure here. Um, so this is really just a very similar version, um, but it gives you a little bit more control. If you want your simulation to have a lot more of the feel of a normal rigid body simulation, um, a lot more of the sort of bounce and really sort of fragmentation, but you still want coming some of this sort of uh, gooey fluid stuff going on, this is a good way to do it. You can basically just have um, your interior pieces being matched to your RBD sim, and then have the exterior pieces just sort of follow along uh, based on getting sort of dragged and pulled using those viscosity properties. So I hope this has been interesting. I hope you've learned at least a couple of things here. Um, I know I didn't go too into depth into the shader, but hopefully um, this sort of idea of having these two separate UVs and basically just look up the texture twice, interpolate between those values based on your rest ratio, uh, hopefully you can sort of sort out how to get that into your shaders for yourself. And otherwise, I think these are kind of fun effects. They're obviously not like everyday things that you would use normally, but I think there are certain scenarios where you maybe want like a stylized explosion, you want to have some of these tendrils, something a little bit more sci-fi, a little bit more organic. Uh, and especially for the entirely flip-based simulation, um, I think if you had some sort of like organic structure or destruction workflows going on, uh, if you had say like a, a creature sim and you had them being sort of blown up or, or otherwise destroyed, you could really get some of that goopy kind of innards feel from that relatively cheaply. You don't really have to do very much in there. The other benefit to the entirely flip workflow, if we just go back there, uh, let me just go back to frame one so it doesn't try to update all the way to 81. If we take a look again at this entirely flip fractured workflow, one of the thing that's things that's interesting about this approach is that you don't need to use sort of nice shapes. So your interior geometry, obviously I just use like a Voronoi fracture here, so these are just nice convex hulls or defining my individual pieces. Um, you don't have to worry about convex shapes in this particular simulation. You don't have to worry about creating nice collision geometry. Um, these can be anything you like. It's a lot more like a soft body simulation. Um, it's just going to solve all of these interior forces and pressures on its own. So you could have, if you went back to your original um, box here, you could have a big long looping cable. It could even sort of go in and out on itself. And you could have all of that be your single viscous object and have that sort of splat and come out as its own shape there. So there's a lot you can do with this type of a setup, and I hope that you found this informative, and I hope you're able to sort of find something interesting to do with it yourselves. As always, please do let me know if you uh, enjoyed this tutorial. I like reading you guys' comments. Um, it's good to know that people are getting something useful out of this, and please do let me know if you've got other ideas for tutorials, if you've got suggestions or other tips, or if you happen to use some of these workflows. I would love to see it and hear about it. Thank you very much, and goodbye.